Um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to... Well, we've just passed the halfway point of the course, haven't we? This is now the second half. Now. Um, let me just touch this on. All right, when we write code, what are our objectives? What do we want to achieve when we write code? Just at a high level. Working program. Yeah, yeah, good. Well done. We're about to start talking about how to change things and make things better. So we're about to try and make things better, and there's no point in talking about incremental changes to make things better unless we have a really clear idea of what it is we're trying to do and what our objectives are. And it's easy to jump in, isn't it? When you see uh, a program and so, uh, problem, someone gives you a problem, you start coding. It's easy to jump in without thinking about it and code something up beautifully that doesn't solve the problem. I'm, I'm nervous that we, we don't want to do the same thing in our thinking about computer science, do we? Let's think about actually what we're trying to achieve. So we, we certainly want a working program. We want working code. Define working as solving the problem. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thanks. Working's no good, is it? What about correct? Correct code. It's got, it's, it just senses, it has this sense of being stricter when we say correct. We're not monkeying around. It's got to satisfy some particular criteria that we've got. It's got to be correct code. It's got to be correct. And what else? What else do we want? Clear. What's that? Clear. clear code. Why do we want clear code? Because if you need to change it later on. <laughs> so yeah, but how do you know you might, you might not? Oh, so he's saying, I'm, I'm just, this is not poo-pooing your idea. I'm just getting a say. <laughs> So, oh, hang on a second, in case you get hit by a bus, <laughs> that's right, there's less incentive for buses to go for you if your code's clear, <laughs> in the sort of jam falling butted side down sort of model of the universe. Um, no, uh, how, so clear code is something I reckon we're going to, we're going to write what our objectives are. And then we're going to look at how to satisfy them. And I reckon down here we're going to write clear code. But I think if you went to your boss, and you're running late on some project and you've got to do so I just need to make it rhyme. Can I just rename all the variables and things to do that? He'll say, ah, I can see that that is satisfying in some way, but I don't want to pay you to do that. So if you said to the boss, I want clean code, uh, he's, yeah, okay, so you get the point. Uh, so some other things that you could convince your boss. Because your boss isn't a bad guy. Oh, hello. How are you? Good. It's good to see you back. Uh, efficiency. Um, uh, I'm going to put that on the side because I'm not sure where to put that. Because um, why would you say to your boss, what would you say to justify this? Just to, that's our grassroots test. You'd say, I need to have a week off. I'm not going to write a new login screen like you want me to because I need to make the code more efficient. I don't think the boss would accept that as an end in itself. What would he say? He'd say, so what? Why does the code need to be more efficient? And what would we say? Makes more money. Makes more Maybe. money. Maybe why would it make more money, though? No, that's just what you tell the boss. Oh, just, <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe our, one of our problems is that we're needing to access from a big database. Yes. At the moment, our code is really slow. Yes. And as one of the uses for it, it needs to be fast. Ah, okay. It needs to be fast because it's too slow at the moment and people aren't using it. I'd say, so it's sort of not really correct in some sense where we left correct wishy-washy. It's somehow not doing the job it was meant to do. Yeah, yeah. So can I fold efficiency into correctness? Then if it was important, there was some sort of criteria here. But I can see it doesn't exactly fit in there. That's just a clutch. Yep, more thoughts, because these are all good thoughts. Yep. Maybe you want to complete, like it may be correct, but maybe do everything in the spec. Oh, yeah, maybe, uh, okay, maybe correct, but maybe you want to add more features to it. Um, How about reusable code? Well, um, uh, yeah, again, I'm not sure where to put that. That's a really good, I'm going to put all these things I'm not sure what to do with on the side. Um, sort of add new dollar worthy features, I think. Yeah, I think that would impress him. I'm still going to sort of try and fold that into correctness at the moment. That somehow... This is here's something else, isn't it? Okay, let's put that on the side because I don't know where to put that. Yep? Reusable. Reusable. You want your code to be reusable. You're saying that to your boss. Why do you want it to be reusable? Uh, in case the problem comes up again, then we need to... He says, well, let's solve it when it comes up again. None of this in case stuff. Well, it'll be cheaper that way. Ah, oh, it'll be cheaper. Cheaper... Um, to make it reusable. 
Okay, you know, all these things are sort of falling in that category, aren't they? They're things that are nice that we could maybe justify in a cost-benefit term. Yeah. What about tricking your boss? <laughs> I like the way you're thinking. I want to see what you're doing. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. No, that's good. No, just teasing. Because he looked like he was working hard. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, so yeah, we want our code to be correct. I guess we want it to be reusable. Can you see that's sort of like a second tier sort of outcome? I guess we want to add new features if we need them. But if we really needed them, presumably it's folded into correctness. But yeah, I think correctness is going to have to be a fairly big hat, isn't it? I reckon we probably want our code to be... Oh... I reckon we want it to be easy to write. Because if it's easy to write, we can write it quickly and it'll save them money and we can put more features in for a given amount of time and we might have spare time to do efficiency and if it's not easy to write, I mean there's some sort of link across here, isn't there? If it's more complex, I guess it's more likely to be incorrect as well. So I reckon we probably, there, I reckon they're my main objectives when I'm writing code is that I want my programs to be easy to write and I want them to be correct. I don't want to spend too much time doing them and when I've done it, I want it to be right. So there, that, you guys have got some extra things on the side here. We'll have to think about that as we go. Maybe you can help me feed them into this hierarchy. So we're going to say that's our objectives. But can I say, I reckon there's, each of these has two different components. One is we want the code to be correct now. And the other one is we want the code to be correct into the future. And one is we want it to be easy to write now. And one is we want it to be easy to write into the future. That's like the other dimension. And I think classical programming, like the sort of stuff you've learned in first year, mm -hmm, is all this, isn't it? We've, we've done this. We spend all our time really emphasizing how easy it was to get things wrong, the importance of getting things right, how to control errors, how to manage complexity. We spent all our time focusing about that. And I guess the big lie, the thing that we didn't tell you is, OK, that's all well and good. But actually, in practice, when you write a piece of software, it's not finished. This is like the second big truth. The first big truth is your program won't work. There's going to be problems. You're going to have to deal with that. It's very hard to write correct programs. And we spent most of first years looking at that and coming to terms with that and working out engineering ways of dealing with it. And the second one is, even if it does work now, it won't work in a week's time because someone's going to make a change and someone else will make a change and a new feature will be added and something. And it's all going to turn into a pile of crap eventually. And if you design a big system up front, you spend six years designing it, or say one year designing it, and then one year implementing it, and it comes shiny and sparkly and new out of the box and you hand it to the client, at that moment, it's a beautiful, correct system but you can guarantee that in two or three years' time, it's going to look like a pile of crap. Because people are going to fiddle with it and diddle with it and add stuff. And, it's not, and, then, and you've done the big design up front, but they're now in maintenance mode. They're not in doing, spending a lot of time doing design mode. So the things they add in will probably be ugly and so on. It'll be like lean-tos and add-ons to a house. Rarely is it as beautiful as the original house. So I guess our first story was uh, you know, dealing with how hard programming is. And then in second year, we suddenly reveal to you, oh, actually, that's actually not the whole story. The, the whole story is that uh, everything changes. And in fact, there's no point in writing the world's best program and being the world's best programmer if your program can't deal well with change because it's just going to be useless really soon. Uh, and is it the case that when you get to third year, just playing the devil's advocate here, are we going to then say, aha, we told you these are the two most important things, but actually... Because it is certainly the case that if you just knew this and you graduated, you'd be crap as a programmer. You absolutely need to know this and change your programming practice to fit in with this. It completely is utterly devastating and changes everything. So is there something we're going to teach you in third year? And we're going to say, oh, you thought you knew how to program, but actually there's this whole new criteria, a whole new third dimension that I didn't mention down here. And is there something we're going to teach you in fourth year? Well, the answer is yes. The answer is yes. And in fact, uh, we, we won't even know them all. You'll find a lot of them as you move through your professional life. There'll come moments when you suddenly realise, if you're a developing professional, you suddenly think, oh, wow, I thought I understood everything, but actually there's this whole new way of thinking about it that I've never taken into account before, and that will modify every single thing you're thinking about. And if you're a switched-on professional, you'll keep updating your practice. And security's going to sit in here somewhere and thinking security-wise is going to be lurking in there, but there's heaps more things to come. 
Now, but it's okay. I don't think we've lied to you or tricked you in any way because I think this is really the most important one and we did it first and this is the second most important one. And the next most important one's not as important as these two. So what we're really looking at this year is how we deal with changes. So how we can write code that's correct in the future, not just correct now, and how we can write code that's not as only as it is right now, but it's easier to keep writing it and fiddling with it and editing it into the future. Okay. So if these are our objectives, what's our program going to look like? What sort of um, attributes are we hunting for? Now, like programming level attributes. What, what are our intermediate things we'll aim for that we hope will lead to these outcomes? Simple, yeah, absolutely. Simple's going to help us with both of these. And simple's going to help us change it into the future. Simple's just great in all respects, isn't it? Simple is so good, I'm going to underline it. That's an excellent one. Simple. Anything else? What's that? Lots of methods. Um, I reckon that's going to come lower down. That's not like... I think it will turn out that lots of methods is probably a reasonably good way of going. But I don't think you could say to your boss, I need to have more methods because that'll give me correct code. I think there's a, a, a step. He'll say, well, why does more methods lead to correct code? And I think you'd have to say, more methods is good because it leads to blah. And notice that blah gives us correct code. By the way, more methods leads to what, do you think? Into what? Complication. Complication, yeah. Um, um, <laughs> uh, more smaller methods might help us with simplicity, for example. Yeah, yeah. So um, the number of methods and the size of methods might be two attributes, we have to think about that here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but any more of these sort of intermediate objectives that we're going to have in our mind while we're writing code? Abstraction. Abstraction. Okay, how's abstraction going to help us? Uh, with writing code into the future. So if we needed to change it, we can change it how we want to change it without having to worry about other people. Ah, okay. So abstraction's good because it lets us uh, change encapsulate, change things without changing other things. Yeah. It's reducing the amount of dependency between things. Yeah. And we have a special name for that in this course. Um, loose coupling. Yeah, loose coupling. Or low, coup low degree of coupling. Yeah, that's right. So abstraction is a mechanism we can use to give us low coupling. That's right. This is what we want to get. Abstraction is a really clever technique for achieving that. Yeah, so we want our programs to be simple. We want them to be loosely coupled. What else do we want them to be? Reusable, 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 reusable. That's going to help us making it easier to write, isn't it? And it's probably going to help us with correctness. So I think reusability is pretty good. Oh, come on, you can do it. Someone say something. Someone that's never said anything in a lecture up till now, just call that something crazy. It might be right. What's that? Jumanji. <laughs> okay, but it might not be right. <laughs> That's an awesome, uh, awesome cartoon series. Okay. Any more? We want simplicity. We want low coupling. We want our code to be reusable. I reckon we want our code to not have duplication. I reckon duplication is a real, it's an important enough thing that it lives up here. Duplication in code, what's the problem with duplication in code? If you change one thing, you'll change another, so it can actually introduce unintended coupling, I guess. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Updates are a problem. It'll lead to correctness problems if you don't update everything consistently. Also, Yes, it's, I mean, it makes it easier to rewrite things, doesn't it, I guess? Yeah, yeah, it makes it easier to change things into the future. Duplication is, um, maybe it's harder to see why it's a, a bad thing now, but it's clearly a bad thing for the future, because in the future when we change things, this is the update thing you were talking about before, you might forget to update the other things, or you might know you have to do it, but you still have to do it, it's a pain in the bum, it's extra work, you don't want to do that. Yep, absolutely. So it's really good for the future, um, but it's also good for now, I reckon. Imagine in your mind, I've given you a program which has lots of duplication. In fact, I did that. I gave you two classes, one to generate a socket connection, one to generate a server socket connection. And there's heaps of duplication between those two classes. Has everyone looked at that for the networking stuff? 
What was the problem with that duplication? How did that impact on you as a programmer? Did it affect your ability to write correct code or making the code easy to write? Anyone that's fooled around with those two classes I generated? What were they called? Does anyone remember what they're called? No, not mindless server. Mindless server used client connection, client socket and server socket. And client socket and server socket were almost the same. There were heaps of duplication between those two classes. It pained me to write them. I wrote them because I want to talk about them in this lecture. You had to deal with them. How did you find dealing with them? Yay. Yay. <laughs> did you really mean yay or did you mean the opposite of yay? Which is also yay. Which is crazy. Um, no. Uh, I reckon duplicated code just adds cruft. It gives you more stuff to read. The amount of information you're getting per words you're reading drops a lot. The fact that they're the same, unless someone draws it to your attention, you don't notice it, so you're having to read a lot of code to get the same amount of meaning that if you'd pulled the common part out and stuck it up the top and just had two little variants on that to produce those two classes, you'd have had to read less to get the same amount of meaning. So it would have been more meaning dense. I reckon it just made it cluttered and confusing and awkward and hard to see what, what, if it was intentional duplication or accidental duplication. I think pulling that duplication out and giving it a good name and then having each of those things refer to that duplicated thing by name would have been a much clearer design. So I think duplication um, actually just makes it everything very confusing and so uh, I think duplication is bad. And I think that gives us our other one. Simplicity, low coupling, reusable, no duplication and unclear. Uh, oh, not unclear. I think if your code is unclear, then although it might be correct now, when you fool around with it in the future, it's very hard to maintain the correctness if you can't really see what parts are contributing what aspects of the correctness. And well, it's actually easy to write unclear code, isn't it, now? But in the future, it's a real pain if you have to modify it. So I reckon these are going to be our objectives. We want our code to be simple. We want it to have low coupling. We want it to be reusable. We want it to not have duplication. And we want it to be clear. Whew. OK. So they're going to be our objectives. So what we're going to do now in uh, today's lesson is we're going to be talking about this thing called refactoring. And we have talked about it already before, remember? And we, we, um, we did an extract out of Martin Fowler's book. Do you remember that? We looked at how he refactored some code. Can someone remind me what refactoring is? Yeah, it's rearranging your code. It's changing your code. Yeah, it's reorganizing it. I like the way you said reorganizing because that suggests to me you're just sort of moving things around and reclassifying things. You're not making new things. And that's right. Refactoring is exactly that. It's changing your program without adding new features to it, without adding any functionality to it. You're not improving the code. You're just rearranging the design of your code. And the idea is you want to keep all the features exactly the same, but you want to improve its quality by fixing up these attributes here. That's what refactoring is. So the idea is you, first of all, before you refactor, just to recap, how do we refactor? First of all, we... Open Eclipse. Open Eclipse. <laughs> I like the way you're thinking. Second of all, we... Right click. Then we sit on the chair. Then we stretch our arm out. Okay, let's skip over all of that to when we actually do something. <laughs> what do we do? What's the first thing we do when we refactor? What do you need before you can even refactor? What does refactoring depend upon? You want to change your code, preserving correctness, not adding features, just changing design. So what are you going to need to be able to check that that's what you've done? Some tests. Some tests. Who said tests? You said tests. I've forgotten your name. Peter. Peter said tests. Yeah, yeah, Peter's spot on. We want a whole bank of tests to test the correctness. We're going to run our code on the tests. Tests are going to pass. Then we're going to fool around with the code. Then we're going to run the tests again, and it's going to pass. And it's still correct, and we're really happy, but it's simpler. That's our plan. Now, should we take big steps or baby steps when we refactor? What will you want to do? You want to take big steps because we're lazy. We just think, oh, I'll just rewrite everything. I'll just tear it all down. It's like me whenever I try and reorganize my room. I say, all right, just block out the whole day. And then I spend the first half taking stuff out of the room and then re-alphabetizing things and doing all sorts. This is massive preparation. The day always finishes before I get it back in. <laughs> And I never actually achieved the outcome of tidying the room. Eventually, I just have to shove it all back in after a couple of weeks because it started to get crap, crapped up and pigeons sitting on it and things. But, um, but I set out for this really ambitious thing, but I failed. 
So for correctness, the idea is what we're going to do is baby steps. You're going to make a small change, run your tests again. Make a small change, run your tests again. Make a small change, run your tests again. And if you do that, you, you will stop, to, uh, stop fearing your ability to make sweeping changes. So when you, your code needs a massive change, you won't suddenly go, oh, that'll never work. I won't do that. You think, OK, I'll do that. I'm going to break that into 27 steps. Here are the 27 steps. After each one, I'm going to push the test button. And suddenly it doesn't seem so daunting because it's 27 small things. Now, how can you break it into 27 steps? Well, you could work it out yourself. But the nice thing about Martin Fowler's book, if you remember, what I really liked about it was it was a series of recipes for common refactorings, breaking them into 27 steps for you. So after you'd practice with his book for a while, or until then, having his book open in front of you while you do them, you can do any refactoring just by going, OK, first I do that, then I do that, then I do that. And it's completely mindless. But actually, that's good. That's what we want in a refactoring. The intelligent part is coming up with where we want to be, working out how we're going to change the design. And then we want the actual transformation of code to be completely mindless, because we don't want to introduce any errors in that. We don't want any thinking or cleverness to be going on there. Uh, we want all the thinking and cleverness to be going in the design step, because as we know, thinking and cleverness is a recipe for making mistakes. So we want the steps to be small and mindless and completely obvious. And in fact, there are brilliant tools now in your IDEs, like in Eclipse, that do the refactorings for you. A lot of the common ones out of Martin Fowler's book. So you'll highlight a bit of code. You could just go down and click on one of the refactorings in Eclipse, say, and it'll refactor that code, and it'll follow those 27 steps, because they're mindless enough that a computer, can, a computer can do them. And certainly anyone that's coming up to do their honours thesis soon I reckon that would be an awesome honours thesis, would be to extend Eclipse to add some more refactorings into it. Like pick some of the tricky refactorings that no one's done and then write a piece of code to refactor it. And the world will use, millions of people will use your code the very next day if you do that. It's awesomely useful code because uh, no one wants to have to do those 27 minor steps. It's much better if the computer does them for you. Okay. So this is the context. This is refactoring. This is what we're about to do. All right. I think there's no more to be said. Let me go and look at my notes. OK, I have one more thing to talk about, and that's something called design debt. Has everyone heard of the idea of design debt? Has, did Al, remember Alex North came in last year when we were doing 1927, the guy from Google, and he gave a bit of a talk. And he promised me he was going to come in and talk about design debt. But just as we were walking in, he said, I've got something much more exciting to talk about. And I can't remember if he ever got to design debt or not. And I have a vague feeling he never did. He didn't. OK. So, um, so he owes us now because we invested a lot of time and he didn't actually teach us about design debt. So here's what design debt. Design debt is something, is an idea. Who, who was the clever one that said it costs money? It saves money. What was your name? Hayden. Hayden said, um, you, if you want to do something, you should tell your boss make you more money. It'll make you more money. And you said, tell them that even if, even if it's not true. Even if it's not true. <laughs> Is there anyone here that wants to work for Macquarie Bank? <laughs> that's, yeah, OK. No, we shouldn't be cruel about Macquarie Bank, because they're lovely. OK, no, that's right. That's how your boss thinks. You don't want to tell them things that aren't true, because you can do it once, but it, it mucks things up for the future once I work out you're conning them. So, but if you get it right every time, it actually makes things easier in the future. But certainly that's the language your boss wants to know about, is money, results, output, effectiveness. They don't want to know wishy-washy things like quality or anything like that. So when you tell your boss, we've got to refactor the code, the code's a bit of a mess at the moment. It's not sufficiently, un it's not sufficiently not duplicated. It's not sufficiently not unclear. It's not sufficiently not unreusable. <laughs> And you tell your boss you've got to change your code, you can't, your boss is going to say, nah. Because it's not a language your boss understands. So programmers have developed an interface with bosses, a boss speak language, that we can speak to bosses and they'll understand. And the lovely phrase is design debt. See, because it's got at the front part the word design, which is something we care about, and in the back part is debt, which is money, which is something they care about. See, and it joins them together. Very clever. So what you say to your boss is this. Well, I don't have to improve the code now, but it's really ugly. And if the more I program with it now, we're starting to incur design debt. And your boss says, what's design debt? And you go, well, what it means is um, we're just sort of borrowing from the future now. So uh, if I don't make the change now, every future change we make to the software will take maybe a bit longer than it would have otherwise taken. And that will cost us a bit more money in terms of hours into the future. And we'll keep going on paying that with every future rev revision we make to the software. 
and it will actually get worse because we'll incur design debt on those changes as well and it will compound and it will get worse and worse until we eventually pay it back, which is take some time, invest some time and clean the code up. And in fact, that's exactly the truth. That's exactly what happens. If you don't fix up the code now, then you do pay for it on future things. And it's just like paying interest if you borrow money. And fixing up the design is like repaying a loan. Yeah, because it makes future changes really easy to make until you start crofting it up again. So design debt's a really nice metaphor and the boss will understand that. So instead of him thinking you're wasting your time, he'll think, oh, you're, we're repaying some debt. We're running down some debt. That's a really good thing to do. We're building up an asset, in other words. That's a really good, good thing to do. Okay, so that's the terminology um, that you could use if you had an unhappy boss. But I think actually around the world now, certainly in all the big software houses, the idea's already sunk in. So I don't think you'd have to persuade your boss unless you were, say, working for some company whose primary goal wasn't writing software and perhaps the design team and the coders uh, um, you know, went to uni quite a long time ago, sort of thing. Okay, so now I want to look at our socket code from last week. Is it really, really hot or is it just me that's melting away? Who's really, really hot? People at the front are really, really hot. Thurston, is the door at the back open? Would you... Oh, no. See, I'm currently coupled to the microphone. It's reducing my future ability to make changes to the system. I need to, before I make changes to the system, refactor to decrease coupling. Okay. Put it back in. No, no. I'm going to do move method. I'm moving that method from the class where it appears to the class where it's actually needed, which is the t-shirt class at the moment. And there we are. And it goes in this class down here, which is reasonably tightly coupled to the t-shirt class. And now I've refactored without changing any functionality. I can now redesign the whole system. There we go. It's done. So now I'm just going to open the door outside so we can get some air. OK, let's. Hello. Uh, did you all have a rest? Should we say that was our break? <laughs> no. It's so nice to have breaks. Why do we like having breaks, do you think? You don't have to think. More precisely, because if you had breaks constantly, it'd be boring, like if you're in bed sick or something, it's not fun. Why do we like having breaks? It makes thinking easier later. Yeah, yeah, it does. It sort of refreshes you. It, it breaks the day into little small bits, and you can concentrate on each of the small bits. It sort of decouples all the sections from each other, and you don't have to carry links across and think of all the interactions. It's just a general system simplification, I think, to have breaks. It's, it's almost like abstraction. If I didn't, in the later part, refer to the earlier part, it would be abstraction, wouldn't it? Complete abstraction. And if I referred to it, but whenever I did so, I did it really explicitly, like saying, oh, and remember in the earlier part we said this, then they're still um, abstract from each other, aren't they? So that's what we should do. Okay, so we're going to have a break now. All right, now it's finished. And <laughs> now I'm going to refer to any things that happened in the previous part. And we'll see if that actually makes everything seem simpler for you. Ta-da! Okay. All right. Oh, that's a quiz. Oh, I'll, no, I've got a quiz to show you. Um, do you want to see the quiz first? I thought I, well, I had this plan during the week that each week now I'm going to write some little quizzes because we're sort of finished with Java, but I want to make sure you know all the little bits and pieces about Java. So I thought, what about each week I write a little quiz, like a self-testing quiz, and I just put it up, and I keep adding to it. And you guys are welcome to add to it yourself too, of little questions like this bit of code, what would you expect to happen? And this, what would you, and, you know, just very simple, not quite multiple choice because that takes a long time to write, but something simple that I can knock together. And then you can self-test, you know, you could just go through thinking, oh, that question, that question, oh, I couldn't get that question out. What do you think of that? So a little bit of Java revision each week. So I thought I'd do the first one in the lecture. Here it is. We've got a parent class, which is in package Java quiz one. It's got a private variable called x and a public variable called y. And they're both set to p because we're in the parent. This quiz is going to be about when a child becomes a parent and when a child doesn't become a parent, when, it, when a child's a child. So if we're in the parent, x and y are p. And the parent has a, a, a method called speak that prints out, I am a parent. And then it runs get data. And get data is a private method which returns the x and y method, well, the x and y attributes. So you would think if you created a parent and ran it and said, speak, what would it print out? I am a parent, x equals p, y equals p. That's what you'd expect to print out. And then I have a static method that we'll look at later on, which shouts, I am a parent, because it's static. 
Remember, static belongs to the class rather than the object. Okay, so that's a parent. And then we've got a child method. Let's have a look at the child. The child has public and private variables with the same names as the parent, called X and Y. The child extends the parent. The child has a speak method as well with the same signature. And it prints, I'm a child and my data. And my data prints out X equals this and Y equals this. So what would you think if I ran speak on a child? What would it say? I am a child, X equals C, Y equals C. Okay, cool. It's also got a special message, that the, a, a method that the parents don't have called text message. And it can print out I are child. <laughs> and the parents don't have that uh, method available to them because they were written before anyone thought of that sort of thing. And then there's a static one where it shouts, I am a child. Okay, cool. Does that make sense? You understand those two classes and one extends the other? Now, mm -hmm. shall I do the quiz first and then explain it or shall I explain it and then do it? No, do, it. Do, it, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. I like the way you're thinking. That's the way we should do stuff. Okay, let's try it out. So here we go. First of all, system.out, Java, what? so you tell me, what do you think is going to print out? Java quiz number one starting. Well done. Full marks for everyone that got that. All right, nothing's going to print out. Nothing's going to print out. It creates a parent, creates a child. P.speak, what's going to print out? I'm a parent, X equals P, Y equals P. I'm a parent, X equals P, Y equals P. Then C.speak. I'm a child, X equals C, Y equals P. Y equals P? I think so, All right, let's see. Let's see. No, don't say. Everyone think in their head what it's going to do. No, no, can I say, no one, don't worry if you get any of this right or wrong. Some of the more intricate things, oh, I've deleted some of them, I, w I wasn't sure about. I think, oh, bloody hell, what's going to happen here? And then I thought, I'll try it out. And so that's actually how this class arose, with me just trying out different things, going, who would have thought? Because Java has a few funny little corners. Let's have a look. It's compiling. I am a child, x equals c, y equals c. Now, George, tell us why you thought it was going to say y equals p, because I can understand where you're coming from. Yes! Don't say things. The private and public variables. Variables. Yeah. Okay, a class has fields, variables. But can I call them fields? Because yeah. I always think of variables as being like local things in the function and the attributes of the class being attributes or, or fields. So the class has public and private fields and the class has public and private methods. And what I've done is I've created, I've said the parent and the child are related, and then I've given them all the same names for their fields and methods. Or most, most of their fields and methods have the same name. So the question is, which field's going to be called and which method's going to be called? Because you've got two with the same name. So how are you going to, how's Java going to decide which is called when it runs the code? All right. So I, I won't give you any more answers. Let's just go through. So now I'm going to create a child called C2. I'm going to call, create a parent called P2. No, oh, sorry, I lied. I, I re literally am creating a child called C2. And then I'm creating P2, which is, as you know, just a reference to a parent. It doesn't make one until I say new. And rather than making a parent, I'm just casting C2 to point to a parent. Does that make sense? Uh, I'll just draw it on the board in case it doesn't. I will give a shiny piece of fruit to any student who, the first student, to clean the board before the next lecture. If someone cleans the board, I will bring you a shiny piece of fruit that you can keep. Won't it get messed up by the lecture before this one? Won't it get what? That, isn't this lecture, the other one that they write random stuff on? I think it's just before this one. Oh, that's all right. No, I'm just saying, just to reset the boards before we come in and save those three seconds I just wasted then. Oh, right. I will give, I will, I will, and if I forget to bring a shiny piece of fruit and I owe you one, I will desert, incur... Fruit debt. <laughs> and I will have to what? Double. <laughs> oh, this is sounding suspiciously familiar. OK. I'll have to do something incredibly more extreme the second time. OK. Um, so let's have a look here. So we've got C um, parent P2 is just a reference. And child C2 is just a reference. Nothing gets created till we run a new. We ran a new to make a child. So we've got a new child. And let's do the old static. So this is, oh, sorry, dynamic. This is at runtime. And this is static. This is the code. That's the parent code. And that's the child code. OK. We said new P2, so we make a new um, parent. Oh, sorry, new C2. So we make a new child. That's a child. It knows it's a child. It's got a little child barcode on it. 
C2 points to it, and P2 points to it as well. But P2, uh, P2 thinks it's a parent, and C2 thinks it's a child. Okay, that's fair enough, because a child is both a child and a parent. Yeah, by the is our relationship, by the in inheritance we got there. So, C2 thinks it's pointing to a parent, a child. P2 thinks it's pointing to a parent, but they're both pointing to the same thing. This is going to cause chaos. What's going to happen? Now, I'm trying this on the internal computer in case it damages the computer. <laughs> C2.text message. What's going to happen here? IR child. Well done, it works. Okay. P2 text message. What's going to happen here? Think about it. What's going to happen? Everyone, everyone worked it out? You should try and follow on because this is really cool. You want to be doing this now, not the night before the exam. Here we go. It's going to... <laughs> ba -ba. Text message is undefined for the type parent. So, although the object we were talking to does have a text message method in it, the pointer that thinks it's pointing to a parent cannot access that. The reference cannot access that. And that makes sense because once we've cast it to a parent, we've converted it to the parent type. And remember our notion of a type is the methods it's got and the attributes it's got, but mainly the methods it's got. So the child has to have all the methods the parent has, and it can have more. And the idea is we can use them interchangeably. So if, a, if you were allowed to get a parent and call the text message on it, you couldn't use it interchangeably, couldn't you? I mean, you couldn't. The code that did that would explode if it was ever given a parent that wasn't a, a cast child. Are there any parents that aren't cast children? Yes, Adam and Eve. Okay. So you can see um, that the type that the pointer thinks it's talking to affects which methods are available. Is everyone cool with that? Now let's make it slightly harder. What about... I better comment out that bad line. What about... We call the methods that's shared. So it's in both of them. So the parents have it and the children have it. But they each do different things. Which one will it do? So we've got child first. C2 is a child, and it's a reference to a child, and we're calling speak. So what's it going to say? I'm a child. X equals X equals C, Y equals C. Is that what you're going to say? Yep. You got it? You got it? Oh, we have another child printing out above. Bloody children. I didn't speak to you. Okay. So there we go. So we, let's just double check. Now we've changed it, that it still works. I'm a child. X equals... Okay. Now, what's going to happen now? Bum, ba, bum. Oh, think about it. Think about it. What's it going to do? I want everyone to commit. This is a $50 million question. Are you ready? Steady. I want you to commit to something. Has everyone committed? <laughs> Tell me when you've committed. Is there anyone still needs to think? Still thinking? Here we go. I am a child, x equals c, y equals c. I am a child, x equals c, y equals c. That's crazy. So what's going on? Does someone want to explain it? We told P, P2, to, to do, run its speak method, and it printed, I am a child. It ran the code from here. It didn't run the code from here. What's going on? <coughs> yes? It's created a child object, not a parent object. Yes, it's because I, and it really is a child. It's barcoded a child. When I made it, it was a child. It was made with new child. It uses the child constructor. It is a child. It can also be thought of as anything above it in the hierarchy. Yeah, it can be typecast to anything above it. But it is a child. And that means if there's a method in the parent and a method in the child that have the same name, then when it builds the child by merging these two together through inheritance and code reuse and so on, this is the code that wins. 
And when anyone calls this object, regardless of whether they think it is a parent or if they think it is a child, it will run the child code. Now, it is utterly important that you get that because that is going to be the heart of some of the interesting design things we're going to do using object-oriented languages. The idea is we can have an object that will have a method called speak and another object that has another method called speak. They both satisfy some interface that insists they have a speak, but the actual code they run does not depend on what type we think they are when we're using them. It depends on what type they actually are. Now, the advantage of this is we're going to be able to replace it. This is called dynamic binding. It's not until the actual execution that Java works out which method to run. It doesn't work out in advance, oh, it's a P. I've got to point it to a parent, so I'm going to be running the parent code. It doesn't work that out at compile time statically. Instead, it waits till it's running, and when it's got the object, only then does it work out which method it's going to run. So methods truly do belong to the objects. Now, this is going to help us replace ifs, because a whole lot of our ifs in our code, in your traditional old C code, are uh, if this is a this, do that. If this is a this, do that. And maybe if you've got a lot of them, you've even made it into a case statement. But in OI, we don't do that. We, we say, hey, this, do that. And the if it comes from, if you happen to be a type blah, you'll do a blah thing. And if you happen to be a type bling, you'll do a bling thing. So we don't actually have to explicitly have the if there. Can you see? It's handled by the dynamic binding mechanism. And we're going to use that a lot. That's absolutely really beautiful. It's one of the really cool things about OI. So is everyone cool? That's called, by the way, what we're exploiting here is um, inheritance giving us, what's this calling it? When, when we change the parent's method, and we gave it, substituted it into the child method in instead. What's that called? That's called overriding. Okay. So I'm going to write that up because that's one of the important three words we're going to be looking at. So I better spell it right. Overriding. Second important word is overloading. What's overloading? These are all about using the same name over and over again. All these three concepts are going to be, I use the same name for the, lots of different things. How does Java sort it out? One of them is overriding. I use the same name for methods. Do, oh, can we override public methods? Yes? Yeah. Can we override private methods? No. no. OK. So we talk about overriding when we've got public methods or default methods or, or, or uh, protective methods. Overloading. What's overloading? Uh, uh, we're about to get to variable values. Well done. What's your name? Symphony. Symphony. Yeah, Symphony Wong again. Hello. Sorry, Symphony. Yes, we're about to get... That's our third one. But overloading means something else. But you're right. That's our third one. Yes? I read about it. Yeah. <laughs> you read about it but forgot it. That's called... That's called delegation. <laughs> so you know the answer, but you're not going to tell me. But if you need it, you can use it because it's inside you. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Yeah, okay. You're keeping it secret inside. It's like that song, Tribute. You know that song, Tribute? Oh, yeah. oh, we won't talk about that. Um, oh, can I just talk about Tribute just briefly? So Tribute is this song, and it's about how these guys are walking along, and they encounter death or the devil or something like that. And and this is our classical thing in lots of fairy tales and lots of folk stories and lots of languages. And when I grew up, there was even a country and western song called The Devil Went Down to Georgia, where this guy was walking along and he met the devil. And basically the thing is, the devil or death or whoever it is, challenges you to some sort of game or competition or contest. Oh, it's like the seventh seal. It's like all sorts of things. And if you win, something good happens or something bad doesn't happen, probably. And if you lose, something bad happens. And in this one, two guys, Kyle and... JB. Jack Black. Jack Black are walking down the street and this horrible, the death appears. And death says, uh, play an awesome song on your guitar or I'll eat you up. Uh, I love you so. And they said, okay. <laughs> and then they sat down and they played something. And it turned out it was the best song in the whole world. They were just lucky. And you're listening to this song, and it is a great song. And they're singing about it, and they're singing the song, and they're doing da 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 And then halfway through the song, they go, of course, the song we're singing now isn't actually that song. This song's just a tribute to it. In fact, 
can't actually remember that song at all. <laughs> but gee, it was good. And it's so cool, because in The Devil Went Down to Georgia, they actually have the guy playing the violin when he's going against the devil or death. And then he actually plays what he played, the devil or death. And you're thinking to it, and you're thinking, that's pretty good, but I don't think that's the best violin in the whole world. But in this one here, they don't show you the song. They just say it was the best song. Can't tell you about it. It was nothing like this song. That's all I can remember. And it's an awesome song. Uh, so what I like about that was I used to think when I heard that song, oh, that's a great example of the old don't piss on the sign sort of thing, the old difference between an object and a reference to the object. But then I thought, no, it's not the same, because it's not that their song is a reference to the greatest song in the whole world. Because if it was, I could use their song to find the greatest song in the whole world. In fact, it's an encapsulation of it, because they're not going to tell me the greatest song in the whole world. They can let me interact with the greatest song in the world only through their song. So in fact, that's encapsulation. So that's exactly what you were doing just then. So the delegation. Their song has, inside themselves, they have the greatest song in the world. They're not going to give me a reference to it. Yep, because that would be leaking. They've actually got perfect abstraction. They're doing delegation. They'll find out things about that song and then tell me, uh, I'm not explaining it very well, but it's a very exciting song, so who would have known that Jack Black was an OO programmer? <laughs> so that's why I couldn't tell you about that song when we were doing C and I was just itching to get to Java. Um, so we're so close. Overloading is this. Overloading is when you use the same function name to refer to two different instances of that function. So you're the child, you've got a speak method, and you could have another speak method. And in C, that wouldn't work, but in Java it does. Java is quite happy for child to have two speak methods. But Java, so they're not confused with each other, Java makes the following restriction, which is they have to have a different parameter list. Not different named parameters, but actual different types. So you could have a speak that took a string and a speak that took a number. And, and you can see that's probably slightly annoying. I mean, it starts being exciting. You think, oh, yeah, okay. The, in, semantically, they're probably doing the same thing. And some of them, they need um, a string to s do the speaking, and some of them, they need a number to do the speaking. But then once you get excited by this idea of overloading, you start to think, oh, man, and maybe I'll have it so that if I'm given a string, I'll say it in Latin. And I'd like another speak so that if I have a string, I say it in um, you know, French. And then you think, oh, damn, I can't have two speaks. You know, it's not discriminating enough. If they've got the same signature, Java will regard them as the same. So it starts giving us a tantalizing hint at what might be possible, but it doesn't carry through and give us it all. But that's called overloading. So in Java, you're allowed to have lots of methods with the same name as long as they've got different type signatures. And where we encounter, and normally that's actually considered to be bad practice, but where we do that all the time is constructors. Okay. Okay. So that's overloading. Overloading is you've got two methods in the same class with the same name but different type signatures. Java disambiguates them, no worries. Overriding is when you've got the same method with the same type signature in two different classes that have an inheritance relationship between them. And then the child method wins and the parent method's gone. That's overloading. And the last thing is called shadowing. It's got an O in it, but it's in the middle. And shadowing is the parent has something and gives it a name and the child has something and gives it a name. And when you're talking to the child and you say the name, you get the child's one. And when you're talking to the parent and you get the name, you get the parent's one. And if you typecast the child into a parent, what are you going to get? No, the parent's one. There's one instance of it existing at every different possible type in the chain or in multiple different types in the chain. And Java just needs to know which type you think you're talking to to work out which one to give you. And that's called shadowing because the later one shadows the earlier one. Does that make sense? Shadowing is different to overriding because overriding replaces it everywhere and shadowing just replaces it in the instance that you're actually looking at right now. And Java does shadowing for fields. Fields. It does shadowing for fields um, and does overriding for methods. So now let's have a look. Let's go through our hard, finish off our quiz and then we'll take our break. Oh, okay. We're nearly out of time, guys. You're written into the break. No more talking. Here we go. What's the output? We've done this, P-speak, we did that one. So what I want you to do basically is I'm going to give you these quizzes and you're going to go home and do them. And the ones you don't get, I just want you to stare at them until you get them. Or Google them like crazy until you work out what's going on. Or ask on the forum or ask your tutor. But not to move on until you understand every little bit of behaviour in this crazy looking file. Here we are. Now, the Y variable, if you remember, was public. Though the X variable was private. So I'm allowed to say C2.Y. Yeah, that's giving me the, the um, I keep saying variable, the attribute. We shouldn't have public attributes, should we? But it lets me do it. So I'm going to run now. What am I going to get printing out here? 
C2Y equals? Well done. And now I'm going to print P2Y. Now remember P2 is in fact the same object as C2, it just thinks it's a parent. What's it going to print out? Can't turn the light. Oh, you can't see. Sorry, guys. Is that better? Yeah. Where's everyone gone? <laughs> All right, what's it going to say? Has everyone decided what it's going to say? C or P? P. P because it used shadowing. Because it was overriding, it was a field that had the same name in both ones. If it was a method that had the same name in both ones, it would have overridden it. But it was a field that had the same name in both ones, so both of those fields exist inside the object. That's sitting there, and the other one's sitting there. And if it thinks it's talking to a P, it accesses the P one. And if it thinks it's talking to a C, it accesses the C one. It's just a disambiguation thing. You've annoyingly got two things with the same name. It's hard for Java to disambiguate it. Disambiguates it based on type. It would have been really simple to see how Java would have disambiguated this if you'd given them different names. Yep, so just imagine that. Imagine they had different names, then it all makes sense. You give them the same name, Java knows doesn't, has to work out which one you're talking about. That's the rule it uses. It's called over, um, it's called shadowing. And is that all? Or did I have a last little one? Oh no, I had a last one. Static speak. Do you want me to do static speak? Do you remember? Um, parent had a static function called static speak that said, I am a parent. I am your parent. <laughs> Luke. And child said, <laughs> No! <laughs> Ah, it's fun being a programmer, isn't it? Okay, so let's see what's going to happen with the child. We're going to run child. It's going to run the child static method. That's easy enough. It's C2 is a child. It is a child. It thinks it's a child. There's no ambiguity here. It's going to do the child thing. No. But now we're going to access the object pointed to by C2, which is also pointed to by P2. We're going to access it, and P2 thinks it's talking to a parent. So which method is it going to run? The child's method or the parent's method? Can I? Oh, yeah, that's right. Thank you. I'm going to. I'll just copy the parent. I'll just ch copy the child one out so you can see clearly which is the parent one. Are you ready? What's it going to do? I am your parent, Luke. Static methods do not get overridden. Only public, normal, object bound things. Static things all happen at compile time, they're worked out at compile time, they're all done statically at compile time, none of this dynamic linking, it's too late. At compile time the, the, the compiler's already decided which method's going to be called at this instant. That's the whole thing with static, it all happens at compile time. So it's simple enough, at compile time if it's talking to a P, a parent, it uses a parent at field, if it's talking to a child it uses a child field and that's it. And now if we run them both together, ta -da! okay, all right, let's have a little break. Uh, you guys move and um, stretch your legs and think, and after the break, we'll return. <laughs>